Hi, I'm Raj Singh. I work with LSU Ag Center, and I'm director of the Plant Diagnostic Center and extension plant pathologist for horticulture crops. Um, so we received a sample from uh, a nursery here in Rapides Parish, and this unique plant is called Ligularia. And you can see on the leaves they are worried about these symptoms over here. Um, so we're going to check it out. But before we do that, we try to look at the sample submission form and the notes they bring to us and see who it came from, is it commercial or homeowner, and if we have enough information on when the problem started uh, and if they have any specific uh, testing to be done for that sample. When a sample comes in, we log it with a number, a unique number that will stay permanently with this sample for the time period we keep our records. Um, so basically it's just a five digit number. The first two digits are your the year and then the last three digits are the sample number. So you can see even with COVID-19 we are at 268 samples this year. So I uh, generally at this point of the year in June, July we are hitting about 500 to 600 samples but because of COVID-19 shutdown we didn't receive that many samples. Here is another example uh, of a sample that's been collected by Department of Agriculture and Forestry. This is a regular sample. This is a quarantine sample. So you can see the difference. This just came in in a regular gift bag. But this sample, it has a number, collection number and everything, and it's double bag. Okay. And this sample, we are looking, we, we have specifications to look this sample, uh, test this sample for citrus greening. So citrus greening is not a, a contagious disease so uh, compared to citrus canker. So we don't recommend that homeowners or commercial growers or anybody who deals with citrus, they should touch any citrus canker uh, symptom, symptomatic plants. But because citrus screening is not, so I'm going to take it out and look at the sample. And in order to look at the sample, I should go to the biosafety cabinet to see if there are any insects or anything like that. So here I'm just visually examining it. Um, the test we are going to run for it is a molecular test. But I want to make sure that we are looking at something which is kind of symptomatic for citrus screening. So you can see this type of blotchy mottling you can see here is some blotchy modeling, here is some blotchy modeling. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, this blotchy modeling can easily be caused by a nutrition deficiency or something like that. And you can see there is some similarity in these two different leaves. They have similar kind of symptoms. So we definitely need to test it. Uh, so for this testing, we have to take the midrib samples out. Now we either do the DNA extraction and then we will run that for with specific reagents that will only amplify the citrus greening DNA if it's there. So in this case, this sample came from a nursery owner in Repeats Parish, and they are worried about this necrotic lesions on the margins of this plant. So in these kind of samples, the first thing we do is take the, the leaves under a dissecting microscope and see if we can find any fungal structures are any signs of the fungal disease. So right now I'm just looking at that affected part and I'm trying to see any any kind of spores that might be produced on it or any insects um, and I'm try also trying to see if there is any because um, sometimes what you what you see is you can look at the spots leaf spots and you can have a little bit of idea that if it is produced by a fungal pathogen or a bacterial pathogen. And also sometimes viruses may produce similar kind of symptoms. So we, I'm just looking for any signs or any, any symptom similarity here. So after this, what we like to do is we will cut this tissue out from the transition zone here where you have the healthy and the dead part. 
and then we played it on different kind of different set of media in order for it to grow out of that medium and then we can ID it depending upon what kind of spores it's producing what kind of uh, bacterial colonies it's producing we can we, we have an idea on what we're dealing with if it's a plant pathogen if it's a fungal pathogen or a bacterial pathogen viruses you can culture out viruses so we have different tests for viruses so once we have once we have them on the artificial media and this is just a plate showing um, a plant uh, that was baited the roots and soil was baited with these camellia discs uh, the pathogen if it's present it will swim up and colonize the leaf discs and we'll take those leaf discs out of it and then we will rinse them with water and then stick it underneath the media this media is very it has all the antibiotics and chemicals in it so it will only let that phytophthora uh, produce into the into the culture so by now you have to look it under the light microscope and see if it's producing the mycelium that you're looking for uh, again these are the so depending upon the type of the mycelium you can tell if it is a, a, a phytophthora or not here I have a good example of the phytophthora mycelium how it looks like so this is actually a coral okay uh, coral reef uh, and the mycelium will look exactly like that it's knobby and uh, it's just if you can imagine this shape the phytophthora most of the phytophthora will be knobby like that so we have a preliminary diagnosis that this is caused by a phytophthora type pathogen so we also uh, categorize our samples depending upon which day we receive them so if you send a sample on a Monday and we receive it Tuesday, Tuesday that will go there in Tuesday so that if we have to go back we are not looking for the sample so we are kind of like uh, very systematic here uh, and some days you get more samples some day you get less samples but we generally recommend that if you are interested in submitting a plant sample you want to do it early in the week so we have time during the rest of the week to diagnose that problem your sample doesn't have to sit over the weekend here at the diagnostic center in order to be processed so once we uh, isolate the once we plate the the affected leaf tissue or the root tissue on the on the on the artificial media then we bring them over here and we store them at a specific temperature so that you can so that we the, the pathogen can uh, start growing out of it here is a good example from hemp industrial hemp uh, the plant was infected infested with infected with the southern blight and once we once we grow it on it and this is kind of a classical example where the southern blight is producing the sclerotia okay a mustard seed uh, size and shape and color sclerotia in the plate once we see this we are about 80 percent sure that this is southern blight okay um, again we have to make sure that we have what species there are different species of the same genus so we have to figure out based on molecular test like sequencing DNA sequencing on what that particular species is so this is my staff here Mr. Tim Burks and Dr. Monique D'Souza um, they, um, Dr. D'Souza started working with me last year and I'm very uh, fortunate to have her and uh, uh, Mr. Tim works over here he has been working with me for how long now? 2012 and uh, he is our lab manager and he takes care of most of your samples here okay I'm, I just send you the report so he is the main man behind all these scenes okay it's okay so this is where we culture our pathogens uh, so you can see here some plates that have produced the mycelium that we're looking for or the fungal pathogen yeah, this is actually not a fungal pathogen it's fungal like microorganism which is phytophthora okay it's basically known as a, a water mold here in this room we do the doc gel documentation system so once we do the DNA extraction we amplify the DNA but you can't see the DNA with naked eye 
But here uh, in this room, what we do is we run those DNA samples and you can actually see the DNA. So we use this, this is called gel documentation system. So once we put all the cameras on and everything, and you can actually then see. So this is a, a new pathogen that we are dealing with here. Uh, the name of the host is American hornbean. Uh, it's a very native tree here, uh, very popular tree here in, in the wild. And here you're looking at two samples of DNA and this is the DNA amplified. Now you can't see that with naked eye, so you have to use this equipment in order to see the DNA uh, from that plant material. And you can see this is a really nice gel picture that is showing you two samples, two duplicates and then two duplicates. Uh, so this is a very good um, DNA amplification here. This is our PCR room where we run the conventional PCR and the real-time PCR. And this is our real-time PCR machine here. The difference between these two PCRs is that the real-time PCR is in real time. So you can see the results while this machine is amplifying the DNA. Um, and the conventional is that you have to amplify the DNA first and then you have to run the gel documentation system on it and see the results on the gel. In this case, you don't need a gel to run after you run the PCR. So this is an example of one of the citrus canker, canker uh, sample that we have here. So you, you see here three lines, okay? So what you are seeing here is two samples. One is our positive, which is this blue line, okay? And the other one is our sample. And you can see it amplified after 21 cycles. Okay, that is a positive, that is considered a positive sample. And here you can see the results. You have the water, which is our negative control, the positive, which is on the another control, and and down here so the for the sample to be a positive sample it has to be in a range um, it can't be after 30 uh, 35 cycles so if it's after 35 cycles that's not considered a positive sample so we are still running a conventional PCR here uh, in this case, the, the, there are three different steps that it will run for several, uh, for I would say 40 steps. And each, each cycle has three steps in it. So you can see it goes to 93 degrees Celsius and then it comes down to 64 and then 72. So this is called denaturation at 93 and at 64, it's annealing those building blocks. So it's making the, the DNA, amplifying the DNA. And then this is at the last step is 72, okay? So, and then it will repeat, okay? It will repeat, it will go back repeat. And you can say it's going to repeat here on this, this particular test that we're running. We are running this for HLB, which is your citrus screening disease. So this will run for 34 cycles. It will run for 34 cycles with these three steps, and then we will go back and use the gel documentation system to see if it amplified the DNA or not. Uh, these two workstations are our clean workstations. Uh, we use them to mix our reagents. One is for making the master mix, and the second one is adding the DNA template that we isolated from the from the plants, uh, from the leaves of the plants, uh, plant tissue.